Uh, when I first wrote this paper, um, which was nearly 10 years ago, quite scarily enough, um, it was re originally rejected uh, by the journal uh, we submitted it to. One of the reviewers said that we don't need an archaeology of animals and we don't need an archaeology from an animal's point of view. Um, at the time, it was quite disappointing because that's not really what we were arguing for. But since then, I've kind of thought about that comment quite a lot. And I've realised that actually, I think that that's maybe exactly what we do need, or at least an archaeology that treats or considers both human and non-human life in similar like, parallel ways. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that I'm going to talk about today. The reason for this is that archaeology is traditionally thought of animals as objectified and static, characterised mainly as nutritional, material or symbolic uh, resources, waiting to be used in whatever way humans see fit. Quite a lot of our archaeological questions on animals focus on animals in death. So as a zoo archaeologist, I might be asking questions like, uh, how old were these animals when they died? Where did they die? What time of year did they die? Why were they killed? And these are tied into things like management strategies or hunting strategies. And once they were dead, what were their remains used for? These are all important and valid questions in, in archaeological study, but I would argue that they are really just the second half of the story. The first half of the story is where we consider uh, the interactions and engagements and relationships between humans and living animals, the things that happen before the death, before the use of uh, animal remains. Um, and it's interesting to think about the way that the, the living non-humans are, are bound into and shape the, way, uh, shape the lives of, of humans uh, in the past. If we want to understand perceptions and relationships and understandings that are materially manifest in our archaeological record, I would argue that we need to consider the living interactions between humans and non-humans first. This is what I have referred to here as a zoo archaeology of life the use of zooarchaeological and broader archaeological data to focus firstly on living non-humans, to explore how non-humans as active living beings played roles in shaping human lives in the same way that humans may have shaped non-human lives. Some people might also call this multi-species archaeology or a number of other uh, different uh, banners that this kind of approach comes under. Now, there are many different ways and many different things themes you might think about here. So previously, I've, I've presented at this conference and others about the, the different daily and seasonal rhythms of non-humans and the ways that these shape human lives um, depending on the species that they may hunt or live with or keep. We could think about how different species behaviours would shape meetings and encounters and how that might shape humans' perceptions of them as a result. We might think about how humans experience non-human sociality through their daily and seasonal engagements with them and how that might also shape the way that humans' perceptions of non-humans are born. But today, I would like to think a little bit about non-humans as world makers. Uh, their ability to shape and change the world in which they and humans live in together. And in particular, I want to show a short case study um, from the site of Thatcham in southern Britain, which dates to the early Mesolithic. Um, and here in particular, the archaeological evidence allows us to trace the lives of both humans and one of my favourite animals, the beaver because they're brilliant. Um, so, Thatcham is located down uh, in southern England in the Kennet Valley, and the Thatcham site uh, sits on the top of a gravel terrace on the right on the edge of uh, the river floodplain, uh, just here. So, as you can see, these different sites here. Um, and uh, in, the, uh, in the early Mesolithic, we're thinking about this area as lush wetland with birch, willow, and aspen, and pine woodlands along the river edge. The archaeological evidence that we have uh, shows multiple occupations all along the terrace, scatters of uh, stone tools and animal bone, um, and numerous hearths running along the top of the gravel terrace as well. What I want to focus on particularly here is activity at site five, which is just here, just in the wetland. And we're also going to think about um, site three, just there, both of which provide really interesting evidence of the interplay of humans and the environment and the non-humans living in that environment as well, 
and as I say, particularly beavers. So here we are at Thatcham site three. Uh, sorry for presenting like, proper archaeological data um, in a theoretical conference. You'll just have to bear with me for a second. Um, so at site three, we've got evidence for human activity um, from uh, the lower layers uh, of uh, the wetland deposits here. So cultural material stratified through these wetland deposits off the edge of the terrace. The radiocarbon measurements we have from these materials, uh, mainly the animal bone, shows activity spanning around about 9,200 to 8,400 Cal BC, which we can see in those radiocarbon dates uh, up there. And the paleoenvironmental evidence um, undertaken by Cathy Chisholm in 2014 shows coincident changes in the frequency of plant species. So we're seeing tr uh, drops in tree pollen, we're seeing rises in um, grasses and sedges, and we're seeing peaks in microcharcoal, all indicative of human manipulation or management of an area of uh, the riverbank woodland using fire, so burning to create small scale management or clearance. Uh, the radiocarbon dates from um, these uh, management events match up really nicely with the radiocarbon dates we have for activity on the terrace, suggesting that these uh, management activities are going on while humans are at this site and occupying it and depositing material on the terrace and into the wetland. What's really interesting, though, is that the material, this sediment um, that the animal bones and material culture are being recovered from, is something called algal marl. This is a material that forms in very, very slow forming or stationary water. Um, now, there are a number of possible mechanisms by which this floodplain, which would be teeming with um, small rivulets um, and, and braided river systems, how this would turn to hold water and produce the um, uh, conditions to form this algal marl. But one of these potential mechanisms is the actions of beaver. We have beaver remains from these um, deposits to show that beavers were active at the site at the time, and the damming of streams and the formation of standing pools of water where beavers build their, um, their lodges is one potential um, explanation for how um, this sequence indicates stationary water as opposed to the moving water we might expect on the river plain, on the, uh, on the, um, the floodplain. So Thatch and Site 5 shows slight or potential evidence that we're seeing a world that's shaped by beavers as well as shaped by humans. But this is really just the starter for the main course, which is Thatcham Site 3, which has a much greater set of evidence to show the, uh, the actions of both humans and beavers at this site. So, um, Thatcham, Thatcham Site 3, we have activity uh, slightly later than Site 5. And in the animal bone assemblage, um, we can see the remains of um, beaver. We're seeing multiple individuals um, of multiple ages, which indicate the presence of one or more family groups in the area, which would suggest that this area is, the, um, is, a, is a local um, habitat used by um, beaver families, as opposed to um, individuals being brought in from elsewhere. Um, we can also see a very interesting feature on the edge of site three just here, which is labeled here as a fish trap with a question mark by the original excavator. This is uh, a, a, a vertical sided narrow channel that's dug directly in from the edge of the floodplain um, into the gravel uh, terrace. Um, and it's been more recently interpreted by a number of people, including uh, Bryony e. Coles, as a beaver canal. And that's what one of these looks like um, in, uh, in a contemporary site. And beavers dig canals from watery areas onto uh, terrestrial uh, grounds. We can think about this as like a watery path that beavers will use to negotiate their way into feeding grounds on dry land. So we can see that we have beaver activity at site three. Um, What's more interesting is that the beaver bones that are recovered from Site 3 are concentrated around the end of that uh, channel, which would suggest that that, that beaver canal is existing um, and then it becomes a site of human beaver interaction, in particular of hunting, and then we see either beaver remains being left there or being intentionally deposited in and around the area after their bodies have been processed. So we see a story of a site where beavers are present, beavers are changing the landscape, they're digging um, 
beaver canals, which means they are moving onto the terrace. If they're moving onto the terrace, it means they're engaging in uh, the consumption of plant materials on the terrace. So they are acti actively shaping the world. What's interesting is that if we look at our radiocarbon dates again, we can see that here is our uh, human activity up here. And then these are a set of, uh, again, um, manipulation activities via burning. So we have uh, drops in trees, uh, pollen, rises in grass pollen, and uh, rises in microcharcoal. These, again, um, tie in quite nicely with human activity. But there is one other thing in the pollen record, and that is evidence of a drop in tree pollen, a rise in uh, sedges and grasses, but there is no microcharcoal there at all. So we have an evident, evidence of a clearance or manipulation event that does not include fire. Now, some people have interpreted this as just humans chopping things down with, tree, uh, with, uh, with axes, but there's no reason, I would argue, especially given the fact that we know beavers are there, we know that beavers are digging paths onto the terrace and therefore almost certainly moving onto the terrace, there is no reason to think that that clearance event isn't in fact undertaken by beavers, not by humans. And the really inter interesting thing is the radiocarbon date for that clearance event comes before these burning events and actually before a radiocarbon date on human occupation. So I think what you can see here is actually potentially humans moving into a site that is already shaped and changed by the actions of beavers. And I would argue here that landscapes that beavers manipulate and change and create are actually quite attractive places for humans. We know that beaver dammed areas uh, create um, increases in biodiversity, increases in the number of species, plants, animals, insects. Um, they trap nutrients and become exceptionally rich places. Um, the trees that are felled by uh, beavers produce coppice poles, perfect for making structures and tools, lovely long stroke poles. So beavers actually produce a site that is attractive for humans to um, inhabit. Then, after a period of occupation where flint tools and animal bone scatters accumulated around hearths on site three, the lowest, um, site three is the lowest of the three um, sites on the dryland. What we see at site three is we actually see um, that this site becomes flooded. It is sealed, the human occupation is sealed underneath a layer of water lane silt, and then it is sealed underneath a layer of tufa, a calcareous deposit which is almost certainly coming from springs that are sitting on the terrace edge. Now, to begin with, there are streams running across the terrace that are taking this spring water and leading it out into the terrace. But at some point, these, um, these terrace spring um, streams get blocked up and water inundates the terrace and deposits tufa and deposits um, the, it floods the site and it makes it completely uh, inhabitable, uh, uninhabitable, sorry. And what's very interesting is that at the same time that we're seeing these hydro hydrological changes that lead to humans leaving the site, the sediments that are being deposited on the site in these hydrological changes contain uh, the beaver worked wood, uh, like this one just here, which would suggest that that flooding event or those flooding events are actually, at least in part, the handiwork of beavers at the site. So, just as beavers made a site that was maybe attractive for humans, beavers then make a site that becomes uninhabitable for humans slightly later. So, beavers giveth, beavers taketh away. So it's really interesting. Um, so this example shows the potential for examining both human and non-humans in the past and how they shape and co-shape the world and the lives of each other. And really the archeological record in this sense is a nexus for the interplay of all life in the past, not just human life. By exploring the ways that humans and non-human lives were bound up together, we can begin to see how non-humans impacted human lives and consider how these impacts may have shaped how humans perceived non-humans. For these, we can think about, sorry, from these, we can think about how such encounters and experiences may translate into human attitudes to non-humans and the treatment and significance of non-human remains. But I would also argue that these kind of narratives have other significant roles to play, and actually beyond just archaeology. 
Research into the living interactions of humans and non-humans in the past also have wider significance. Human-non-human -human environment relationships are at the heart of a number of contemporary issues we're facing today, such as climate crisis, biodiversity loss and potential mass extinction events. And these are issues that require a rethinking and a renegotiation of our relationship with the world around us. For example, one approach to tackle biodiversity loss and habitat destruction is rewilding, the returning of control to non-human agents who can manage environments in ways that are proven to be more successful and fruitful than human management. But to see rewilding as a viable solution requires an acceptance that non-humans can be active and intentional agents of change in the world. Our archaeological narratives of the past can play a part in that by challenging the orthodoxy of current attitudes and by showing that human-non-human -human relationships have not always been the same. Narratives of the past where humans had dynamic and effective relationships with non-humans in a world that is co-shaped by human hands and non-human paws, hooves, mouths, claws and feet may inspire new directions for human attitudes to the world around them in the future. Thank you very much.